I'm Keelan Dirty, a software engineer at Comcast, and uh, I'm going to talk about how to write a static analyzer in, for Go code. Um, so this presentation is going to go over what static analysis is, why you would want to write one, uh, what makes for a good static analyzer, and how do I actually go about writing one. And the analyzer we're going to be talking about today is uh, one that checks that after you uh, opened a connection or a file or something, uh, that you've ch uh, handled an error and then you've closed it afterwards. And then there are some uh, discussion of false positives that you might encounter along the way. So first, what is static analysis? Um, uh, the idea is to check that some arbitrary property holds about your program. Uh, and, and you want to know that without running it, hence the static part. Um, uh, so answering questions about your program without running it, uh, examples of static analysis tools that you might have run before, the Go compiler itself. Uh, the front end of the compiler is, uh, it will parse and type check your program and report errors about like, the, the syntax of your code or if the types are consistent. Um, uh, you run this all the time. And there's uh, go vet, or command vet, which integrates a bunch of static analysis tools into it, like uh, checking, for example, that your format string is correct. Um, there's static check, which is a large suite of tools that uh, is very popular in the Go community, and that uh, is in many uh, project CI pipelines. Um, uh, if you tech, uh, step away from programming uh, and, and consider, uh, like, uh, anal analysis tools in general, uh, you might consider like a spelling grammar checker for a, doc a Word document to be uh, uh, like a sort of static analysis tool, or grappling over uh, like some text for some pattern to be a tool. Although they're not as semantically focused on, uh, on a code base or a particular language, they're still checking for patterns and things. Um, so the types of questions that you might want to ask about a program Right? Are my types consistent? So if I declare a variable of type int and I try to concatenate to it a, a, concatenate to it a string, uh, well, that's going to have inconsistent typing. Um, um, uh, it, and, and so your Go compiler will complain about that. Uh, is there a data race in my program? So this is something that's pretty hard to verify statically uh, unless you, know, you introduce a ton of annotations. Uh, but if, uh, if you use something like the Go race detector, uh, which will introduce instrumentation so that when you run your program, it'll like, uh, catch these issues at runtime, then you'll be able to find these errors uh, a lot of the time. Another thing you might want to ask about your program, am I leaking connections? So if you have like, some web server that's constantly op uh, opening and closing connections to a database or some, uh, or some network device, uh, you might be like, uh, uh, creating tons of connections uh, at like at runtime, and uh, it, you want to make sure that like over the course of your program running for uh, uh, many hours or days, that it's not slowly leaking more and more connections. How do you check that uh, without deploying to produ production um, or to a, a like a, a long-term testing environment? Um, uh, or are you using the proper units for arithmetic? So uh, sometimes you might uh, like multiply a time dot second by a time dot millisecond, or add those things. And uh, in, in, according to the Go's type system, those are just integers. They, they don't have separate types. And, uh, and so uh, like, uh, one thing you could do here is to introduce some static analysis tool that checks that, uh, hey, uh, you're, the arithmetic that you're doing doesn't really make sense. Um, uh, so why exactly would you want to write your own static analysis tool? There's uh, plenty of static analysis tools uh, out there, uh, like in static check and, and go vet. Uh, uh, like, uh, first of all, why would you want to like, uh, use one of these uh, outside of your compiler and, and testing environment uh, in the first place? Um, so I guess if we, we should first talk about like, uh, how you catch issues in, in a project or a program. Uh, you'll often go through this pipeline of you compile your program, uh, you uh, test it, uh, in, uh, either do unit tests or integration tests. You might introduce logs, um, uh, uh, metrics, and traces to uh, uh, to uh, ingest information about like uh, uh, related to like sending alerts, um, and you might use that information to like uh, debug your program. Um, static analysis uh, comes in very early in this pipeline, like around when you compile it. You could argue that static analysis might come before you compile your program because you know you're, uh, in your editing environment you're often getting a bunch of errors from your editor. Um, 
and uh, and so like why would you uh, need additional tooling outside of what your compiler or your uh, testing tool provides? Uh, well, the advantage of static analysis, uh, or the disadvantage of unit tests, I should say, is that like it's often easy to miss, miss edge cases. You might uh, be checking that a property holds for everything, for all of some input or data set, and you might not be able to test exhaustively test every single item in that data set, so you may end up uh, uh, hitting an edge case. Um, uh, uh, an issue related to observability is often that like it can be hard to trace back issue to to the uh, source in your like actual program because it's further in um, uh, uh, like it, it happened way later when you deployed it and if you notice that uh, that picture before uh, the further along in the pipeline you were the the redder things got and that uh, and that was meant to signify that like it's often more expensive to fix an issue when you've are already deployed a program. Uh, and so, it's a stack analysis can be a, a pretty cost-effective way in terms of like uh, dollars, I guess, uh, to catch things earlier. Although, like, uh, there's something to be said about the amount of work you have to put in to, uh, to satisfy a static analysis tool. Um, um, so, so rea and really, you should just think of static analysis j as just one ad additional thing in your tool belt. And if you can uh, write a static analysis tool, that can often uh, pay off if you have a, a pretty bespoke situation in your uh, I I on your project that uh, you can't find anywhere else. So uh, let's talk about what makes a good static analysis tool. Um, a good static analysis tool will provide some meaningful results uh, to to the user. That is, uh, for many definitions of meaningful, uh, meaningful meaning like you're. Uh, you're getting an error that uh, is actually like real, so that it's not a, for example, it's not a false positive. Um, uh, uh, your, uh, your, uh, uh, the issue is something that occurs common, uh, commonly enough that it's not just like a one-time thing that you could just fix by looking at it. Um, it could, uh, hopefully, it hopefully uh, catches something that you probably don't want to see later on. Some, uh, probably some uh, big issue. Uh, and, and a lot of these uh, uh, good qualities I'm talking about apply to alerts as well, so there's a nice correlation there. Uh, here's an example of a uh, uh, false positive that you might see. For example, if you use GoVet and you uh, use fump.println and you pass in like uh, percent percent %t, this is a false positive, uh, it will show an error to you because uh, it can't uh, actually check that you're, uh, 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 you're not using the format string uh, with a percent %t in it. Uh, which is for um, percent t is for true and false for for, for, for boolean arguments, um, and uh, and uh, and so some static analysis tools, if you use uh, static check for example, will allow you to suppress these uh, uh, these errors. So you might be able to put a lint ignore uh, comment above your code to uh, tell it, hey, ig ignore this uh, issue. It, it's not something that's actually real. Um, so uh, we know that we don't want false positives and uh, to, we want to provide meaningful results. How do we actually write a static analysis tool? Uh, so in our case, we want to find something, uh, write a tool that uh, uh, checks for errors and closes connections, um, or uh, checks that we close connections. So uh, before we like, go into like, uh, like some the, the Go packages that might allow you to do this, uh, let's uh, try to use some sim simpler tools that use pattern matching. Uh, for example, there's a very popular tool, SEMGREP or RuleGuard, which are written by members. Uh, well, RuleGuard is uh, written by one of the members of the Go community, um, who, uh, uh, where you can write a pattern uh, about some Go code, and it, and you can just sort of run it uh, on a huge uh, code base. So you don't actually have to write a bunch of code to get it to work. So uh, this is a pr pretty nifty way to do things. For example, if we have this test program that opens a file, you know, handles some error, and then it calls close twice, um, uh, RuleGuard will allow you to use these uh, dollar sign uh, patterns to, uh, uh, like, uh, to check that like there's a not a uh, to to refer to variables in your program. Um, for example, uh, if I wrote a thing that checked for uh, double closes or a close that happens more than once. Um, I could uh, write this uh, pattern that has uh, uh, that checks that I've assigned something to a closer and error, uh, 
And then there's this underscore thing that says, hey, I don't care what's on the right-hand side of this assignment. And then some, this wild card thing that says, hey, zero or more things in between uh, that last assignment and this close call. Uh, that, that, that's why there's a star there. And then, then there's an actual call to close. Uh, and, th and there's another, and that pattern is repeated. There's a zero or more uh, statements followed by a closer.close. Now, uh, now, the reason why there's a dollar sign in front of closer and error is that it's not actually the name. You don't want, uh, you don't want a variable named closer or error. You want a variable, uh, whatever variable it is. Uh, that's why there's a dollar sign. Um, and uh, then you, might, uh, you can add, add additional constraints to it, for example, that the uh, variable uh, that is referred to by closer, the identifier closer, uh, it actually um, is, uh, it implements uh, IO closer, the IO closer interface. Um, and, and then if you encounter this situation, then you can uh, say that, hey, we found a double close. Um, and, and so running this on that test file will uh, return an error like this. Uh, now, if your situation is a bit more complicated and can't be uh, uh, captured by a pattern matching tool like this, then you might want to go into looking at the Go analysis uh, packages. And this, uh, this, like the analysis framework, is 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 the way that all the st uh, stat the static analysis tools uh, are typically built in Go. Uh, static check, command vet, um, uh, Go please, they will all use uh, uh, the analysis tools, um, the analysis framework. And uh, really, it's just a struct that you have to fill out. Um, and you declare some package and you have some struct that is of type analyzer. And the, the main important uh, part of this struct that you have to fill out is the run method, as you can see at the bottom here, and, uh, or, or the run function. And the run function, it just takes this uh, thing of type pass and returns an interface and an error. Um, and, and so that's the main part. This other stuff is related to documentation and what other uh, analyzers you want to have run before it. Um, so in our case, uh, this, this close check that we were talking about, uh, let's uh, declare a variable in some package that I call close check. And this struct that we're going to fill out has the name, documentation, this run method that I haven't actually written yet. And, uh, and I'm going to require something. I'm going to require that, it, uh, that um, an inspect.analyzer has run before this, uh, this analyzer has run. And that's a key thing to remember is that we don't want to have to you know, parse, type check our program before uh, we run our analysis stuff. We want the program to already have been uh, uh, parsed and type checked. And we want to just look at the, uh, like the, uh, like the typing information that's already been reported by the type checker and take advantage of that information. Um, so uh, by saying that we want the inspect.analyzer to run before or that we require it, we're just saying that that should be uh, 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 that we want, like the type information, the parse tree, and all that stuff. Um, okay. So look, look, let's think of a strategy. We, it's, it's usually good to have an idea of what's the kind of uh, pattern that you're looking for, or what are you trying to test. So in our case, we want to check for some assignment uh, where I say L value here, but really I want the left-hand side of the assignment to have some closer, whether that's a file, a connection, whatever it is. Um, and and an error, uh, and, it, and if, if there's an error, then you know we want to uh, make sure that we handle that error before we call close on the connection, and uh, and that we call the uh, when we don't you know close the connection more than once. Um, so that's the strategy we're looking, or the pattern we're looking for. So we start off by run, writing this run method. Uh, here's some like basic boilerplate you'll probably need for most analyzers you write. Uh, it's that. Uh, uh, at the top, you want to uh, actually get access to the inspector. Uh, the inspector is some uh, is this object returned by the inspect analyzer that we wanted to run before our analyzer ran. And so the inspector, once we get it, uh, uh, it's going to have all sorts of information for us, like the type information and uh, the parse tree and, and such. Um, there's another thing we need to pass it, which uh, we, we need to declare. It's, it's called a node filter. And the node filter is just an array of the kinds of nodes we're looking for in our syntax tree. So that we don't actually have to walk the whole thing ourselves and, and, and say, hey, we want, we want to look at like a, a block or a statement or, a, or an expression. Here we can just say we're, we want to look at all the assignment statements uh, and then start from there. So uh, that's what this node filter is. And then at the end, I just have a, a return for the types that we're, uh, variables of the types we're turning. Um, okay, so assuming we have all that, 
Um, the, inspect, the inspector uh, 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 has a couple methods on it. One of them is a uh, width stack. There's also a traverse method. Uh, there's a bunch of just methods that it has that where it runs over your, uh, a program uh, in, in, its, in its syntax tree. Um, and in our case, we want to just um, uh, use width stack. And the key thing about width stack is it'll pass in the entire stack of nodes that uh, or path of nodes that lead up to your current node. So if your current node is uh, like an assignment statement, you probably want to have access to the block that it's inside. So if I'm assigning uh, like connection error equals uh, open a file, um, uh, I want to know that the, uh, the outer scope that it's part of so that I can check that, hey, I've closed something or I've checked that I've handled the error after it. So uh, that's why I'm using with stack. So uh, you could probably do some other, uh, a regular traversal, you know, keep track of state yourself. But I like with stack because I can just directly access its outer scope. So, you know, I passed in the uh, node filter that we created before and this, uh, this function, which is the actual thing that it's, that's called on each assignment statement. Uh, so this function takes in a node, a push boolean, and a stack. Um, and I've already discussed what the stack is. The push is really because it's uh, the traversal uh, goes down the stack and or down the syntax tree and up the syntax tree. Uh, we want to uh, uh, just look at the uh, program when we're going up the syntax tree. We don't want to look at the assignment statements twice. So uh, uh, we don't really care about this boolean here. We just want to make sure that uh, we we check the Boolean that, hey, we want to, uh, we just want to analyze it on the way up. So we check if we're pushing uh, and we just return true uh, then to say that, hey, just keep going. Okay, so uh, ig ignoring the push part, we t get the statement that uh, in, from, from inside of the node that we're given. Um, this, this node represents like some node in our syntax, uh, syntax tree. And we check that it's an assignment statement. Uh, here, I'm not check uh, handlings, uh, anything in the type assertion, because I know for a fact that it's an assignment statement because that's all that's in my node filter, which is I just want assignment statements. So I can just say, hey, I got, an I got a statement here. I check that the statement uh, is a, uh, is a defined, has a defined token. Uh, so if you look at the documentation for an assignment statement uh, uh, in, uh, in the Go AST package, it'll show you that uh, there's some token uh, associated with the assignment. It could either be a regular equal sign or it could have a colon equals, as we know from a, a, a regular Go assignment. And the, and the colon equals is actually a short variable declaration. Um, and we, we only want to look for those. So we're gonna, if it's not a short variable de declaration, we'll just return false and say, hey, stop going down the syntax tree. This is not what we're looking for. Um, so now that we actually have an assignment, we want to check that, hey, uh, we uh, there's a, there's a closer on the left-hand side, and there's possibly an error on the left, left-hand side. So um, well, let's do that. We have our assignment statement, and we're going to iterate over the left-hand side of it, which is left LHS is just another field on, uh, on, on assignment statement. And for each expression on the left-hand side of the assignment, uh, we're going to first check that, okay, it's an identifier. Uh, so uh, already we're in a situation where, okay, what if you're assigning to some variable, uh, some uh, thing in an array, or uh, then this would probably not handle that, uh, right? Um, and so you have to ask yourself, is that such a common scenario in my uh, code base that I want my analysis tool to cover cover it? Or is every case uh, place where I'm creating a connection something, uh, a situation where I'm assigning to some identifier? Um, so in, in our case, we only care about uh, ID identifiers that are being assigned to here. So uh, if it's not an identifier, we just skip it. And then here is where we're actually using information create, uh, reported by the, uh, the pass. So we're, uh, uh, the pass has a field on it called types info. And we're uh, accessing types info and definitions. And we're basically accessing all the type information for that identifier. Uh, and so first, we're saying, OK, uh, uh, grab the uh, uh, type information for this identifier and call it type, um, and then check that the this type implements a, an I/O closer. And notice here, I haven't actually shown you how to grab the interface type for I/O closer. And also check the uh, uh, check that um, whatever that type is that it implements error. Um, so uh, as we're iterating through the left hand side, one of these variables might be a closer, one of them might be an error. Okay. 
Okay, so here's how we're actually defining the closer and the error type. So there are multiple ways to go about this, but we actually want the go types definition of this, uh, this interface, which is a little bit complicated uh, to get. Um, for errors, it's, it's not, not terribly complicated. We just go to the universe of types in Go, and we look for something called error, and uh, we get its underlying interface. And that's the error type that you see at the bottom. For closer, uh, you can try to use like the packages like the uh, importer importer package to actually get the IO closer type uh, embedded in, in your binary or embedded in the package information. Uh, but uh, a, a probably simpler way to do it is to just define it yourself because interfaces you can just define yourself. So uh, we will define an interface using the types package. This is kind of like using reflect where you're saying, okay, this type. Uh, this interface is, c consists of a bunch of functions, and this function uh, doesn't take a receiver. Uh, it has no parameters, but it returns an error, and the error return type, because functions can return multiple, uh, multiple values, um, you need, it's a tuple, so you create a tuple, and inside that tuple you have a variable, and that variable uh, corresponds to something of type error. So it's a lot of, like, uh, like it's, it's kind of gross, but it, uh, like, it's, it's done here. And it's not variadic either. Um, and that's all. And then you, say, you call complete to say, here, build it. Uh, so that's how the closer type and the error type are defined. Um, OK, so we have our closer type and error type. We, uh, we defined them, and we, uh, like, we looked for them on the left-hand side of an assignment. A and so now we, we, grab, uh, we uh, want to grab the outer scope. Of, uh, of, our, uh, uh, of the assignment so that we can actually check that the connections are closed, that the errors are handled. So we, we grab the scope by saying, okay, uh, well, the stack gives us the, ensures us that the last element, the thing at the length minus one, is an assignment statement. That means the thing at length minus two is a scope. So, uh, uh, well, it should be because uh, you can, in Go, you can't have uh, like statements outside of. Um, uh, some scope, uh, just by the definition of the language. Uh, so we want to grab that uh, scope at length of the stack minus two. We got the scope. Um, and, uh, and, and now we probably want to figure out, uh, we probably want to only start looking for all the error handling and uh, connection closing code after where our assignment shows up. So we can just you know, get the index of the assignment by just iterating through this list of statements inside this block inside the scope and saying, OK, if the statement is the thing we're looking for, if, if it is the assignment statement that we uh, uh, got earlier, then, then assign this index, uh, that to assign index and break out of it. Well, we got the assign index. Now, um, we, uh, we actually want to do, uh, have the logic of you know, checking to see if there's a close after uh, we've uh, uh, created a connect, uh, gotten a closer, um, or created a closer, rather. Uh, so, assuming that uh, closer var is not nil, uh, if closer var is, is nil, then this analysis pass won't even be running. So we uh, we need to make sure that it's not nil uh, when from when we uh, uh, iterated over the left hand side earlier. Um, uh, we say that we haven't found close. Now uh, let's iterate from uh, it, from uh, assign index uh, to the end of the list of statements in our scope, and see if any one of those statements corresponds to a close operation. And, and I haven't actually shown you how to implement the close operation here, uh, or checking that uh, statement is a close. But we just want to uh, check, uh, assuming we've written that function out already, we'll, uh, we'll say, OK, is this statement a, uh, a close? Um, and then uh, we pass in the identifier, the closer var. Um, and and if, if so, we say that we, uh, we found it. So now we actually have a situation where we can report an error if we have not found a close. Uh, this is the first instance where we report an error to a user. Uh, there's a method on the analysis pass uh, type uh, called report f. And so we're going to pass in, uh, we can pass in a position. All of these uh, objects that we get from the AST have positions associated with them. And so we can just pass in one of those uh, positions. In, in our case, we can say, uh, we want to probably say something like, uh, this, because there's no close called on this, we want to get the position of the identifier uh, that uh, corresponds to the closer variable. So we'll say, hey, um, uh, here's a token position. The, the close method is not called and pass in the name. 
Now, uh, let's see if we can improve this somewhat and make it more robust because we probably, yeah, it's important to check that we closed uh, some uh, connection, but we also want to uh, uh, must, must possibly check that um, we haven't called close uh, multiple times. So uh, let's, uh, instead of uh, keeping a Boolean, we'll keep a counter saying uh, num closes is zero. And then every time we encounter a close, we increment that counter, uh, num closes plus plus. And so now, uh, uh, we can say uh, at the end of that uh, block, uh, if num closes is zero, so do the same thing as earlier. We say that, hey, you have not called the closer. Um, um, uh, otherwise, if it's more than one, then you called it multiple times, which is also probably not good, uh, and, and point that out to the user. Um, you could al also imagine extending this to maybe handle defer, which is not much more complicated. It's just handling another kind of statement here. Uh, and you probably would just extend the isClose method. Um, um, now let's add the, our error uh, handling uh, logic here uh, to check that we handled an error right after we created the, uh, uh, we did the assignment or the short variable declaration. Uh, so we, we assert that the thing after uh, the, uh, the assignment is an if statement. Now you could be even more robust about this because in Go there's multiple ways of doing control flow. Like you could assert that it's a switch statement or a, or, or any uh, or like a or an if statement with a uh, like a like a predicate at the beginning of it. Uh, but uh, uh, you also have to ask yourself: Are those ki the kinds of patterns that I expect to be seeing in my code base? Are people using switch to check for errors? Likely not. So you can probably just do what uh, fits your situation the best and say, okay, if uh, if it's uh, not okay, so if this is not an if statement, or if if it does not contain the identifier uh, corresponding to error variable, so if the if statement does uh, condition does not refer to the error, then we're probably uh, not handling the error, so we can report an error uh, for that. Now, there's an uh, you, here's another situation where you could probably uh, uh, check if you wanted to check that we're actually returning out of the function or exiting some. Uh, area of control, you might want to use something like a control flow graph that is another analyzer you can run, or like the SSA package, which is another uh, uh, other analysis information you can get. Um, so let's go back to the uh, is close um, uh, uh, function. How do we check that uh, we, um, uh, that the statement that we have uh, is calling close on some identifier? Um, uh, in Go, you have a uh, uh, when you call like a method on something, and that's just a statement by itself, it's actually an expression statement. Uh, and so every single construct in Go has a corresponding node in the syntax tree. So instead of running through the, uh, every node in the syntax tree, it's probably best to uh, think about like which of these nodes do you actually care about. In this situation, we're looking for uh, a, call, a call expression. We're looking for a method call to close. Um, and so we grab this me uh, these method calls, okay, uh, 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 corresponding to uh, we grab the, uh, like, if, if it is a, a statement, an expression statement, and it's a call expression inside of there, uh, we check that it's uh, a call expression be, uh, on this identifier, and we, uh, we, we check that the, the selector, the selector expression, the identifier associated with it is the same as the one we passed in. And we also check that the uh, method's name is close. And so this should be good enough to check that you're actually calling close on that method. Um, uh, now, in the case of uh, contains ident, or checking that like some node refers to your identifier in some way, uh, remember we use this uh, to check that our, like uh, our error handling code in our error condition uh, refers to our error. That's why we wrote the contains ident function. Um, here, we probably just want to do a general generic traversal over that node. Uh, the AST package has a method called inspect, or a function called inspect, and it will uh, just call uh, uh, your function that you pass in on every single node uh, down the tree. Um, and so uh, you can just pass in your function and say, hey, if the node that we're looking at is, um, uh, is, uh, is the identifier that we care about, in our case an error, the error variable, um, then, uh, then we found uh, that identifier in, inside of, uh, it's contained inside this node. Um, otherwise, we haven't. So that's what this function really just, just does. It's just checking that inside some tree that you have this identifier. Um, OK, so now if you actually ran this, uh, you would see uh, uh, something. Uh, well, first we want to package it up into some sort of tool. Um, uh, so it, it, for Go analysis, you can use something called a single checker. 
there's also like a multiple checker uh, version. This is what command bet does. But if you want to use a single checker, this basically creates a command line tool for you as long as you pass in that global variable corresponding to the analyzer we talked about before. Um, so in our case, we, would, uh, uh, we write this uh, checker at the top. And we, uh, 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 after compiling it and running it, we run it against our, our, our test program or our test package. Um, and it'll be able to tell us, hey, you call this a close, method, a close function method uh, multiple times. And, and you could try running this over uh, arbitrary code, and it will be able to report uh, with, uh, with uh, and, and likely catch like if you've called close multiple times or, uh, or if you haven't handled an error, unless you're doing something really weird, like checking for an error but not actually returning or, uh, do, uh, uh, or something like that. Um, uh, but, but now you know how to actually extend the, your analysis tool to handle those cases as well. So uh, I, I want to uh, uh, conclude by saying consider writing static analysis tools. It's not uh, uh, like uh, terribly difficult. If you, uh, like, f first of all, just try looking at the, uh, the pattern matching ones like rule guard or semgrep. Semgrep, you just write it in a YAML file and it'll be able to, uh, like, uh, uh, test those patterns against your, against your code. If you, uh, but using the Go analysis framework is also pretty useful uh, 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 because like all of the work has been done with you uh, regarding like type checking your program, parsing it, and all that stuff. You can just use these uh, previous analyses that have been done to build up your own. And it's usually something like uh, ch uh, like check some uh, uh, property holds for some value in your uh, for some node in your tree, um, and. And in terms of writing a good static analysis tool, try to provide meaningful results. So uh, make sure that there's not too many false positives. And if there are, try to adjust this tool. Otherwise, you, uh, programmers won't want to look at it, and they'll just uh, you know, ignore it. Um, uh, and, and try to find something that will uh, hit a lot of cases in your code base.